So let's talk about the second most popular family of reactions that happens with food, caramelization. Now, you've probably heard people refer to caramelization before, uh, and maybe you've eaten caramel. Um, caramelization as a family of reactions refers very specifically to uh, certain things as caramelization reactions that in the popular discussion, if you turn on the Food Channel and watch some famous chef say they're going to caramelize something, often they're actually still talking about the Maillard reaction. So caramelization is specifically the reaction of sugar with another sugar. And again, as with the Maillard reactions, we can, since we have uh, dozens of different sugars that might be reacting, and we have a whole bunch of products that might arise, this is about a family of uh, reactions and a family of products and a family of reactants. And so there's many thousands of things that may arise um, when we conduct a caramelization reaction. Now, a, a thing to point out here, here's my friend, the piece of toast. Um, and uh, I decided not to cook this just for this video, but for example, you might hear uh, someone refer to caramelizing the onions for before making some dish that contains onions. They're probably not actually caramelizing onions. Most of that browning reaction in the onions, as with the toast, is between the amino acids and the sugars, so it's Maillard reactions. However, if you have a sugar reacting with another sugar, that's caramelization. So there are some free sugars here on the toast, so this brown might have a small component of um, caramelization occurring, but it is much, much more likely what you're seeing is from Maillard reactions than uh, pure straight up caramelization. If you want to see nothing but caramelization, the best way to do it is to get out a pan, put some sugar in it, turn the heat up and watch what happens. And in fact, I think I will go uh, do that for later in the video or for a second video so I can show you the uh, stages that happens there. But at the moment, we'll just think about this as a, as a thought experiment. The longer the sugar sits there on the stove, uh, the, um, it'll start by being transparent and it'll just melt, and then it will begin the reaction. And the reaction, uh, you know it is occurring because what happens? Because it gets browner and browner. Uh, and in fact, the end point of that reaction, if you let it go uh, kind of as far as it goes, you go off the end of caramelization and end up just generating carbon, driving all the other components of the sugar out usually into the air as steam H2O, right? So it leaves carbon behind, water up in the air, and perhaps some carbon dioxide. So uh, <clears throat> what... Uh, what we see in caramelization, probably not as much as what's happening uh, when you are baking things, but definitely part of candy making and definitely um, a flavor component that is important and uh, shows up frequently with things that are based in sugar and things that are based in starches, uh, because as the starches break down, you get sugar and caramelization. So again, when we have uh, caramelization, actual true honest to goodness caramelization, it's a sugar plus another sugar reacting and this react family of reactions also happens above uh, 300 degrees Fahrenheit. In fact what you can see, and I tried to highlight on the last page, on this color scale I, I uh, mapped out this over here, this darker brown 375 Fahrenheit, uh, whereas down here just above boiling you see Basically, it, it looks like a puddle of sugar water, which in fact it is. And if you look closely as we go through the 300s, which is this series up here, um, you see that it's getting slightly browner, right? It's a little bit golden around 350, and then you hit, uh, you get over 350, and it starts getting darker brown very, very uh, rapidly. Um, and so uh, we have. Um, in the same flavor, uh, in the same um, in the same temperature range as the Maillard reaction is where we find caramelization. So no wonder people get these things confused. They're kind of happening at the same time, and they may be happening in the exact same place because 
We need sugars and proteins to get Maillard. Uh, we need sugars and sugars uh, to get caramelization. So some sugars will find other sugars under Maillard uh, conditions. And so this reaction happens. And again, we get flavors, aromas, and colors. Um, they're slightly different this time, though. So the colors here, instead of being kind of uh, branched and including things like nitrogen, they fall into what they call carmelans, carolins, and carmelines. What creative naming. And these are just uh, basically hydrocarbons that look a bit like the original sugars, but are increasingly long uh, chains. So not worth drying out because they're just uh, really big, especially 125 carbons, um, uh, as you go up in the names. And if you ever see caramel color on a uh, ingredient list, that's that, those are the, pretty much the compounds you're looking at. And how do we get those? Well, it's easy. You just burn some sugar, run water over it, and you end up with a uh, brown um, solution that you can then add to other foods and give them a nice browned color. You can even paint it on uh, your cheeseburger to make it look like it was grilled. Huh, I wonder if anybody does that. Yeah, they totally do. Okay, so that's about the colors. Now let's look at some of what's happening with the flavors. And I'm going to actually paste this right in on top this time. Here we go. We have some of the flavor compounds. So we start over here with the sucrose. And the sucrose doesn't have to be sucrose, but this is just an example. Sucrose breaks down into its component fructose and glucose. And then they start either, so they, they might make uh, polymers or very, very short polymers, which are oligomers, uh, which is what happens in the color compounds we just talked about. And uh, they also kind of fracture and react and you get things that are smaller that tend to be flavor. So you'll see things like ethanol here, which uh, is a flavor. You'll see acetic acid, which is the acid from vinegar. And you'll th see things that have uh, nutty, burnt, and caramelly aromas and flavors. You'll also see, um, look at this, benzene. Benzene, again, toxic chemical, not a thing that you want a lot of. You certainly would uh, be ill-advised to go pour yourself a glass of benzene and drink that. That would be a very, very, very bad idea. Uh, but it is something that just uh, naturally arises at generally very, very, very small uh, low composition in a reaction such as this. Uh, one last thing that I want to say is when uh, to American palates in particular, in general, uh, when you say caramel, people are thinking of the milk caramel, uh, which, you know, the sort of thing that you find in a Milky Way bar. Um, and they are not thinking about true caramel, which is what you get shown in this picture here where I just put some sugar into a pan and cook it till it starts to burn. Uh, in general, this flavor here is read by folks as burnt. And again, that's a cultural palate thing, not necessarily a true thing, um, or universal thing, I should say. It is true. It's just not universally taken as a bad taste. So uh, a true caramel tastes a little bit more burnt. Um, people interact with it possibly um, on top of a creme brulee or when they have a mistake in cooking. Uh, whereas the milk caramel, which has many more Maillard reacted uh, compounds as a uh, relative to the straight up caramelization compounds, uh, has what many people feel is a nicer, mellower flavor and is almost universally what is seen in products named caramel in the United States. Uh, putting that aside for the idea of making a cracker, in a cracker you will find Maillard products and you will also find caramelization products.